Welcome to The Authority File, the academic library podcast from Choice. Choice is a publishing division of the ACRL and the publisher of Choice Reviews, CC Advisor, and Resources for College Libraries. I'm Bill Mickey, the host of the podcast and the editorial director at Choice. The ACRL has a long history of involvement in helping to shape the evolution of scholarly communications and the academic library's role within it. That involvement took a more specific shape back in 2000 when a task force recommended that ACRL formalize its activities around scholarly communications, and by spring 2002, the association formed a standing committee of the ACRL Board of Directors that ushered in new scholarly communications initiatives. Since then, and along with the Research and Scholarly Environment Committee, ACRL has rolled out a variety of programs and services that address scholarly communications, including the release of periodic research agendas, one in 2004, another in 2007, and the latest, which we'll be talking about in this episode, uh, was just published on June 12th. I've been paraphrasing here from the introduction of the report itself, which you can download from Israel's website. It's called Open and Equitable Scholarly Communications, Creating a More Inclusive Future, and it's a pretty big deal. It's much broader in scope than previous agendas, both in terms of its recommendations and how it was assembled. It's more ambitious, and it puts social justice right at the center of the agenda. It's also more action-oriented by several degrees. The report is also part of ACRL's broader core commitment to equity, diversity, and inclusion, which the association currently is undertaking as a division-wide focus. The report is a product of an open and inclusive planning and research process that incorporated input and feedback from a wide range of individuals, organizations, and membership. It was prepared by Nancy Marin and Rebecca Kennison, with Paul Brackey, Nathan Hall, Isaac Gilman, Kara Malenfant, Charlotte Rowe, and Yasmin Shortish. Joining me on this episode are Yasmin Shortish, RESEC Chair and Associate Professor and Assistant Director of Research and Education Services at James Madison University Libraries, and Nathan Hall, Associate Professor and Director of Digital Imaging and Preservation Services at Virginia Tech University Libraries. Yasmin and Nathan orient us on what exactly a research agenda is and how this one was assembled and written. If you're headed to the ALA Annual Conference in Washington, D.C. later this week, you can attend a session to learn more about the agenda, including how to submit a proposal for a research grant to further the agenda's recommended initiatives. If not, ACRL is hosting a webcast on July 15th. You can register for that on ACRL's website. In the meantime, here's Yasmin and Nathan giving you an insider's view of ACRL's latest research agenda, Open and Equitable Scholarly Communications, Creating a More Inclusive Future. All right, I'm wondering if, um, if you two can sort of briefly describe what the research agenda is and its origins. And Yasmin, why don't we start with you? Sure. So ACRL committees have produced research agendas um, in various areas over the years. And uh, the way they've structured the research agenda is to essentially be a report that documents what work has been done in an area so far and what some promising activities currently underway are in the field. But then really what the questions that warrant further research to deepen our understanding or action in that area, what are those questions? Mm -hmm. What are the key questions that can really move the needle in any particular area? Um, And so the last agenda that was focused on scholarly communication was done in 2007. So we've had a lot of change since then. Right. Um, both in the field and publishing and also within the profession. So um, the committee, the Research and Scholarly Environment Committee, which we just abbreviate and call RESEC, um, (laughs) saw the need for a new research agenda. Um, So the work of the committee is to help meet ACRL's goal of the library workforce accelerating the transition to more open and equitable systems of scholarship. Okay. Um, with that kind of goal, we wanted to be really intentional and specific with the agenda. Mm-hmm. And so when did the, the process of starting this latest uh, agenda begin? Uh, the process of designing the study began in winter of 2017, 2018. 
Mm-hmm. And the data collection took place through the spring and summer of 2018, sort of followed by an iterative uh, synthesis and, and editing uh, process. Okay. Yeah, talk about that a little bit more, Nathan. Um, you know, what were, I think it seems like, and I could be wrong, but it seems like the way uh, the team approached uh, the development of, of, of this uh, agenda was different than in, in, in previous iterations um, in terms of fielding a survey and and sort of um, um, soliciting a lot of input from the community. Can you talk about some of the things that kind of were involved in, in sort of gathering the data for, for the report itself? For the report itself, um, there was uh, a number of focus groups and uh, uh, workshops and surveys, and uh, the the idea was to be as broad as possible and get more voices in um, mm-hmm. than it had been in the past. Uh, previously, um, there was uh, the um, previous research agendas. They would sort of congregate a few people in a room. as predominantly white people from predominantly elite universities and organizations. And they were always really smart people with good intentions, uh, mm-hmm. but because that group lacked diversity in a, in a number of ways, Resex saw an opportunity to, opportunity to um, broaden the dialogue, to include more perspectives, and even reevaluate what counts as scholarly communication. And to get those more, to get more perspectives, that meant um, uh, reaching out to a number of people that uh, that the researchers and Resec identified um, together um, as sort of, uh, I guess, guest experts. And right. and so th- those were some focus interviews. Um, and then we sort of identified where else to host workshops and interviews um, and focus groups. So that happened at a number of conferences throughout the year, such as the um, Joint Conference of Librarians of Color and Library Publishing Forum, um, ALA, Yasmin, there, were there other conferences? At, at ALA Midwinter, yeah. And I, I want to jump in here to say, um, you know, the, the key difference for us as a committee was um, trying to be as intentional and explicit about the community component as possible. Mm -hmm. because we felt it was really critical to enfranchise the community in the work of of forming the agenda itself right um and and also to say that when the previous research agenda was done in 2007 you know it would have been hard to even define the work of scholarly communication to the larger community at that time you know that was 12 years ago (laughs) um (laughs) So we have a lot more um, instances of scholarly communication in libraries. It's become a part of the professional vernacular in a way now that it was not in 2007. So I just want to be, you know, acknowledge that these two approaches are very um, based in in time of of the profession's response to scholarly communication. Um, and also our own um, how things in scholarly communication have been moving over the the past decade where we've seen persistent gaps um, and, you know, persistent missed opportunities to have a really inclusive process um, across all of scholarly communication, right? Not just libraries. Um, And so that's that's sort of the... uh, perspective we were trying to bring to the um, data gathering and uh, theming of the of the agenda right well it also seems you know obviously very intentional and purposeful in the way you've um, incorporated you know a, a broader section of the of the academic community and in, in, into contributing to the report and the direction of the report um, because of the report's actual theme, I mean, there's sort of a reflection of um, what you're saying in the report um, mm-hmm. to actually who helped contribute mm-hmm. to it as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, who, who was on the team specifically who, who drafted it and who's, who's responsible and who's behind it? Well, um, 
of course, Nancy Marin and Rebecca Kennison uh, mm -hmm. were the primary researchers and authors of the report. Um, they were selected as consultants from a public call that we made for proposals. And through that competitive process, their proposal was selected. Um, so they are the, the heavy lifters for all of this work. <laughs> um, and then we had a, a smaller group um, from the committee membership who kind of took point in providing feedback, um, working through various iterations. Uh, and those individuals are uh, myself and Nathan, and then Paul Bracke, Isaac Gilman, Charlotte Rowe, and Kara Malenfant with ACRL. Okay. I also want to add that the, um, Sorry. The, the various participants, there was uh, over a thousand people participated in the workshops, interviews right. and focus groups. And so the report is a synthesis of their values and priorities, and they contributed their own, uh, mm -hmm. the, the effort of, of articulating their, their opinions uh, and, and experiences. And so it's, um, they all contributed. Uh, there was also an iterative, uh, one of the drafts that was released earlier um, was allowed community feedback. So really anyone could come, could chime in and say like, you know, this isn't the way that this is, this, my experience reflects this another way, or here's additional sources. So there was a lot of, it was really a community effort at that point too. Right. That's excellent. Um, how did you um, select who you're going to interview and who participated in the, in the focus groups? Um, did a call go out for that or? Uh, was there sort of like a consensus on, on who you wanted to, to speak to for those? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Nancy and Rebecca um, designed the focus groups thematically. So mm -hmm. they had um, a series of focus groups, I want to say about 12, that they held virtually through a, um, a platform like Zoom or something. Right. And um, and. They were thematic in that they had a focus group where they wanted to have participants from two-year institutions, for example, mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. we want to have participants from um, uh, historically underrepresented groups in the profession or something like that. So they ran a series of focus groups that were that were very um, that were designed, right, not just open necessarily. Okay. Uh, and those uh, invitations to participate with links, you know, to sign up, uh, went out through various listservs. And um, they also had identified some uh, people, that, individuals that they wanted to interview um, through their research, through the literature and the field. Um, and then, you know, we came up with ideas of uh, venues that they could hold these uh, workshops at, like JCLC, um, and then, yeah, then that we made the decision together that, that having this open document that anyone, you know, with the Google link, right, <laughs> can, <laughs> can comment on anonymously or, or not. Yeah, right. Um, okay. And then some of the interviews with experts, th those people were identified by the researchers, by Nancy and Rebecca, and by reset committee members, and we kind of came up with a list together that they reached out to individually. And those experts were, and we were trying to get people who work in scholarly, com scholarly communications who have been strong advocates for greater equity, diversity, and inclusion in the profession. Okay. So, so the report is divided into three primary sections, um, people, content, and systems. Um, and I'm really curious to, to hear how you um, arrived at those that particular breakdown and those sections. I'm wondering if um, maybe Nathan, you can you can take this one and talk a little bit about how those sections were or came into came into being. Those are themes that emerged in the data that Rebecca and Nancy collected and synthesized. And there mm -hmm. could have been other ways to organize it or frame it, but it was through conversation at JCLC, the the Joint Conference of Librarians of Color, that really crystallized these sections, as opposed mm -hmm. to many more priority areas, which, which was a, an earlier iteration. Uh, this research took a constructivist mixed methods approach, um, which is to say that they, they used the data that they had to find what was in it, uh, to, to identify what the dominant themes are and how to articulate it. And they okay. used multiple forms of data collection. And they brought, Rebecca and Nancy brought their own experience and theoretical lenses to their work. But I, I think it's organized in a way that 
works very well for the readership. Um, librarianship in general uses systems to mediate exchanges between information and people, both at a, a micro level with like reference questions and instruction about how to use databases, uh, as well as at a macro level with how we design buildings and programs and how we organize labor to best serve communities of users. And in fact, I mean, it's kind of taught this way in library school too, that, that information science is the nexus between um, uh, humans, uh, technology and, and content, or it, but it, which maps directly to people, content and systems. So um, that's, that's how we arrived at that. Excellent. And yeah, I think, I think the agenda does point out um, that there are sort of overlaps between those three, you know, um, uh, sections, but, um, you know, that, that sort of the overall structure kind of works really well that way. Um, and you take special care in, in sort of in defining, um, what you mean by open, inclusive and equitable. Um, and these are qualities that, that the report very purposefully infuses into the entire agenda. And, and as you note, these terms are sort of quote at the heart of, uh, the charge given by ACRL for its newest research agenda and are extremely broad. Um, in, de in defining these terms, um, you are actually remarkably open, inclusive, and equitable in your approach to that. And, and um, Yasmin, I'm wondering if you could talk about how you arrived at those definitions and in the context of this report, what they, what they mean. Yeah, definitely. Um, it, it sort of was the most important part to get Right, because <laughs> yeah, it is right. it is sort of grounding um, the report. And so Rebecca mm -hmm. and Nancy did a lot of research um, to propose some starting definitions, right? Because you have to start somewhere. You have to <laughs> put something out and see how people respond to it. Um, and so that was part of the survey uh, and the focus groups was they proposed some definitions for open, inclusive, and equitable mm -hmm. and, and asked, you know, do these resonate? What do you think is missing from this definition? What doesn't resonate with you? Um, and in the end, we, I think we got richer definitions um, that are in the report and um, the introduction of the report kind of steps you through that process. Uh, so you can see some of the, the feedback from the community to these terms. Um, and it was important to um, to get definitions that we could say, you know, we reasonably think that these are shared definitions, right? That mm -hmm. the, the community has come together and said, okay, yeah, we can buy in that this is what open is and that this is what equitable is. Um, because developing that shared understanding, that shared vocabulary is really critical for the kinds of work that we're talking about doing in the agenda, mm -hmm. right? Um, and to get that framing right from the first place um, can hopefully bring people together to do the work a little bit, a little bit quicker, right? right. Um, and with more um, purpose and alignment in the work that we hope that they they use the report to do. Mm hmm. Okay. Um. Also in the introduction to the report, there's this, a passage that encourages the academic library community to sort of situate research and practice. Um, the identifying challenges in scholarly communications is one step, um, but to actually affect change, one must practice recommendations from the report as the research is actually being conducted. Um, um, this is, as the agenda notes, is something the academic community has not always been so good at, and that is recognizing the connections between scholarship and practice. Um, and, and Nathan, I'll, I'll throw this over to you. Maybe talk a little bit about why this is so important, particularly since social justice concepts figure heavily in the agenda and how the agenda calls for large-scale studies across the full range of institution types. And then um, if you could also just briefly describe how the agenda itself offers steps for readers to implement initiatives uh, and, and research that helps uh, to execute on the agenda's recommendations. Uh, yes. So um, I'd say ACRL feels to me like predominantly a, a, an organization of practitioners. So if we're going to mm -hmm. do a, a research agenda, it has to be something that people can actually use. Um, and, you know, these practitioners do 
many of whom do uh, rigorous research, um, but we wanted the research agenda to actually move the field forward and not doing that by ourselves, but to provide opportunities and to incentivize people to, to make that happen. So we've got the um, uh, built into the research agenda, there are uh, research questions that people can explore and even uh, possible projects or suggested projects that people could uh, could take on uh, right. at various at varying types of institutions and then uh, this uh, summer uh, we're releasing well also we're also releasing a call for proposals for grants uh, up to five thousand dollars per per project uh, to help uh, people conduct that kind of research and you know for some institutions that might not seem like very much, but uh, it's certainly enough to host a, a generous set of you know, focus groups or to push out a, um, a survey pretty broadly. Um, so we're trying to, the, when, when the original charge of the research agenda came out, it was, um, in, in addition to making it open and inclusive in, the, in its process, it was also uh, identify ways to make sure that the research actually gets done. And we do that by providing these research projects, these sample research projects or inspirations for other people's research projects uh, so that they can pursue that and actually move the field forward in these ways and not just, well, that was our research agenda, now we can move on to our next project. It's right. ACRL wants to uh, support this and and um, and allow these changes to, uh, to happen and, and to give them to make them successful. And if I can just jump in too, to um, Nathan's excellent points, it's in in designing really what what were these key questions, what are the key areas that need this research done to have the greatest impact on the field? Um, I think we all were very aware that we didn't want these to be um, sort of academic pursuits that that can only live on paper right, right? and cannot cannot yeah. actually change the the systems that we're talking about changing the behaviors in some cases that we're talking about changing and and the culture really mm -hmm. um, that we're talking about here and so finding that um, that suite of uh, questions and areas um, that are sort of lever points that have the most potential for impact, but are also doable, <laughs> that are also <laughs> implementable. Right. Um, that was a, a, a lot of effort and thought um, across the, the group, because this was a very collaborative effort, went, yeah. went into that. Um, and I think, you know, I hope we did it right. <laughs> yeah, no, I, it certainly seems like that. I mean, the, the agenda itself, it just has this extra dimension of, um, I guess, actionable. Uh, it's it's more actionable, I guess, um, than, than sort of merely sitting there as a report saying, okay, here's, here's sort of the status, uh, you know, the lay of the land. Uh, but it also is sort of, it has all of these, as you say, levers that allow folks to, um, you know, start doing things that they, you know, and, and moving, um, moving things forward. Um, so I want to get a little bit, uh, more granular and, and talk about, um, uh, a part of the, uh, something in the, in the people section of the report, um, where you discuss workforce related topics, uh, especially EDI and, and, and raising awareness around creators rights, but also how, um, scholarly communications um, is represented as a professional designation. Um, I'm wondering if, if you could describe how this is defined or not uh, among academic library uh, job descriptions and how this creates a challenge for making research initiatives more open, equitable, and inclusive. And Yasmin, we can stay with you on this one if you want. Okay. Um. So, you know, I'm, I'm hearing this question ask a, a couple things, I think, <laughs> which is um, sort of how are academic libraries defining scholarly communication roles in yes. job descriptions, yep. right? And, and, you know, how does that affect making research 
more open, equitable, and inclusive. And I think... Um, right, or in some cases, I'm, there may not be a definition mm-hmm. in, in, in a role or, or a specific a designated role in that respect, which also presents a challenge, I think. So scholarly communication is a really interesting um, facet of our profession, I think, in that um, currently I sort of see um, still some uh, inconsistencies across uh, the profession in in how it becomes institutionalized in jobs. Um, in some cases, you know, there are these singular scholarly communication librarians mm-hmm. <laughs> for the institution, um, and that person generally, you know, it, may not have um, institutional power to make uh, changes across publishing initiatives or um, instructions or collections. Um, They reside in very different uh, departments, institution to institution, right? There's not a, a standard sort of accepted practice across academic libraries that if you're going to have a scholarly communication librarian, and it's almost always a singular person, <laughs> but that person is in, you know, uh, collections or in instruction or whatever um, sort of buckets of departments uh, an academic library might have. Mm-hmm. So um, so the defining of the thing is uh, not a settled point. Um, we've heard from from people in the course of of the research and and in the report um, that you have a lot of people who do work in scholarly communication that that have those words never appear in their job description right Um, and this sort of what is this work (laughs) and and how is it valued by the profession um is still an unsettled argument, in my opinion, um, for some reason. <laughs> and, right. so, and so I'm hoping that the report helps elucidate some of these activities and and um, communicate the value of those activities, regardless of whether you have this title um, or you or your library has a department or anything like mm-hmm. that. You know, the lack of that shouldn't dissuade libraries from engaging Mm -hmm. with these topics um, and with the landscape. Now, the other part of this question was about um, making the research more open, equitable, and inclusive. Um, That is a multi-part effort because the research uh, landscape is, is across the academy, right? right? So, you know, you're talking about being able to affect change at the, um, not just from the library's perspective of how are we doing outreach and supporting our communities and constituents in their own research and scholarship efforts, but what are the cultures of research and scholarship across the academy Um, What are their values and how are those values sometimes um, not the most inclusive and not uh, giving a lot of space for equity Mm -hmm. and and how much um, traction or um, influence can our profession have on our colleagues in other professions in the academy, right? Mm Mm-hmm. Okay, so I, you know, um, I want to talk about uh, collections a little bit here, um, and, and and how the report uh, or the agenda recommends more open and diverse collections. Um, a collection can be defined one way in terms of how it reflects the research priorities of an institution, but there's another layer where that collection can and should be diverse in its representation of that uh, particular research community. Um, what are some of the research questions that the, the agenda raises that could help ensure and improve diversity of collections? And, and Nathan, why don't, why don't you take that one? Okay. Uh, so uh, just quoting from the report, uh, some of the research questions that help ensure and improve diversity of collections include um, 
uh, how are openness, inclusion, equity, and social justice considered within con- collection development policies? And mm-hmm. I'm guessing in the most cases that they're not. Um, and in fact, I, w- I was at a conference last week where um, one of the speakers uh, posited, you know, asked, you know, there's no um, diversity policy that talks about open access and there's no open access policies that talk about diversity. And that's, that's a gap right there. Um, and I think that relates to this too. Um, so how do, with, with, when a collection, when a library is developing its, um, its collection development policy, uh, do they consider, um, representation across broad areas of, of not just, oh, these are the researchers we have and we have to support their agenda, but how do we make sure that there are things available that, that can allow students and researchers to expand their horizons with regard to, to different experiences, um, and particularly you know, non-white and non-Western experiences when, when we're talking about a North American context. Um, right. And then another research question that deals with this, um, with ensuring and improving diversity of collections is, um, Again, quoting from the report, from the agenda, uh, are there non-written or otherwise non-traditional cultural heritage works being produced locally that should be acquired? In what formats do they exist and how might they be preserved? What intellectual property concerns should be considered? So uh, libraries don't have to just collect books and journals. There's, you know, things happening all around us right now that, you know, if, if we're working with our communities, not just the community of, not just the academic community in the that's a bubble within the broader community. But if we're looking outside of the academic walls, um, there's cultural heritage work being produced locally that could be acquired um, if it can be done so ethically um, and, and in, as a partnership with, with those communities rather than as, a, uh, rather than as a, um, something that we do to them or that we take from them. So yeah, mm-hmm. there's sometimes colonialist well, right. <laughs> and, and I've also heard it, you know, the, the, uh, sometimes distilled that colonial aspect of, of in collection development is sometimes countered with, um, uh, not about us unless it's with us. Um, mm-hmm. I, and I think yeah. I said it wrong, but that's the, the gist that, that don't mm-hmm. study, um, a group, um, don't study a community unless you have that community participating in, in the, um, in the study itself, um, fr- from an authorial, authoritative perspective. Um, so that's, those are some of the ethical considerations that could come up, uh, in working with, uh, non-traditional cultural heritage works, uh, okay. being locally produced. And that could be acquired for study. I mean, I guess you could wait, you know, 200 years and then your collect, your special collections department could start buying it. Um, but it's, it's probably better to start working with them now because you'll have, if the people are still alive, you can, you can actually talk to them and work with them. Exactly. Yeah. All right. So throughout the report, um, and up, but particularly in its own section, you note that, um, systems and I'm, I'm quoting here, uh, built to privilege those in power, reinforce the status quo and present persistent obstacles to innovation and change. Um, describe what you mean or what the agenda means by that and, and what it's inverse um, a more open system, both in access and infrastructure, um, could look like. So I'll speak firstly, generally sure. about systems, you know, systems are created, um, to sort of perpetuate themselves <laughs> and to standardize practices. Um, and so that they're not individual dependent, they exist sort of, uh, without a single person working on them, right? That's why we have systems <laughs> right. uh, for process. And uh, many of the systems and the systems that we talk about in the report are things like publishing, peer review, promotion. These are really big societal systems, mechanical systems, right? Mm-hmm. Um, have been built centering um, and I'm going to use a real generic term here, Western ideas of what constitutes scholarship in mm-hmm. their design. Um, so what format that scholarship might take, the actual area of research, like what's being studied, um, who's being cited. These have become prescriptive practices that um, have many times 
uh, serve as like a gatekeep for the academy, right? For what right. what actually counts as counts with you know quotes, right? Um, as scholarship, as mm-hmm. as actual research, um, and that's all done with this implicit assertion that there is a way to produce and share knowledge, right? A singular way, mm-hmm. which is ludicrous because humanity has been sharing knowledge in very diverse ways for hundreds of years. <laughs> um, but we've worked ourselves into a, a way because of designing systems. Um, so things that um, present these obstacles to innovation and change, I mean, sometimes it's about like topic areas for research um, if it doesn't fall in line with a canonical view of a field. Um, we have very tangible barriers, so um, paywalls, right? Then, so there's a philosophical barrier and a, and a sort of monetary tangible barrier right. of, of paywalls and how you uh, can access literature uh, without subscriptions um, or with certain types of authentications. And are some people able to be authenticated and others aren't? And you're a public institution, what kinds of... Um, tensions lie there Mm -hmm. um we talked about in the report you know the kinds of scholarship who gets cited um does does who is cited somehow make that scholarship more valuable or less valuable valuable Mm -hmm. so there are these kinds of biases um that exist that have knock-on effects for things like promotion and tenure right so um so the the inverse, right? What what we are hoping for more open and equitable and inclusive systems. Um, we have some research questions that get to that point, but <laughs> <laughs> that you know that there are fewer barriers to information and to knowledge sharing across peoples. Um, that the uh, promotion and tenure systems are. Um, able to not rely on sort of prescriptive crutches that have implicit biases built into the design, right? Mm, right. But that can look at things more holistically and, and generatively um, for for a body of work and also for, for disciplines that change over time, which is another aspect um, that, that people have resistance to like change is scary and so people (laughs) don't want their (laughs) disciplines to change but they do um and that the systems of of producing the scholarship so things like peer review and who's on the editorial board um need to be more inclusive so that we have this broader range and this more representative and accurate range of human experience being shared with one another Okay, excellent. Um, so lo- lots of work to be <laughs> done. Um, so the, the report is currently available. The agenda's out. Um, and I'm wondering if um, Nathan and Yasmin, you could talk a little bit about sort of the ongoing rollout plans in terms of, um, um, you know, what the community can do and how they can kind of learn more about the agenda. Or um, I think you have some more events coming up where you'll be discussing um, the agenda itself. Um, what, are, what are some of the plans in the near term for that? Uh, so our rollout, our promotional uh, plan was to, we, we, we presented the work at a uh, ACRL 2019 in Cleveland at Library yep. Publishing Forum 2019 in Vancouver. Uh, I just came back from Electronic Publishing Forum with, with Nancy Marin. Uh, that was in actually in Marseille. France. Uh, We'll be at ALA next week. Uh, There'll be an Emerging Leaders poster session uh, on Friday afternoon. uh, Mm -hmm. An Emerging Leaders group that we worked with will be uh, um, doing a poster and report on different ways that people can interact with the research agenda and we'll be taking up their work after they after they conclude. Um, And then the Scholarly Communications discussion group Sunday afternoon. Um, And then uh, we'll be talking about it at a uh, if oh and then Saturday the um, Saturday morning um, will be the um, the news you can use session um, yeah. and then later uh, in the summer uh, IFLA uh, will be at uh, there'll be a poster session at IFLA in Athens 
And then later this year in CNRL News, there'll be a, uh, an article there uh, to promote the call for proposals. And um, we're talking about some other things, too, that we want to do um, that nothing's firmed up yet. Um, but we've got a, um, as, you know, as you mentioned, it was out now. It was released today, and, and it's uh, been described in the uh, ACRL Insider. Yeah, and then we've got the, the the call for proposals, as I mentioned earlier, for the for the five thousand dollar grants. Uh, yes. yeah. In order mm-hmm. to, and that's kind of what we're trying to promote through all this, um, through, through this uh, blast of, of publicity and, and conference presentations, um, is promoting the not just the research agenda itself, but how people can interact with it and how people can extend it through their by adopting research questions or coming up with their own and and we'll fund their work um, and and promote it as well you just heard from yasmin shortish and nathan hall discussing the recent release of acrl's newest research agenda open and equitable scholarly communications creating a more inclusive future You can find all of the episodes of The Authority File on your favorite podcast app or on our website, choice360.org. Just click on the librarianship drop-down. On choice360.org, you'll also find information on Choice's entire product platform, including Choice Reviews, CC Advisor, Choice Webinars, resources for college libraries, our research reports, and a whole lot more. A great way to keep up with The Authority File is to join the Choice Authority File Facebook group, which you can access via the Choice Reviews Facebook page. As a member of the group, you can give us feedback, suggest podcast participants, chat with other listeners, and submit new topic ideas. Sponsorship and advertising for the Authority File podcast are handled by Choice's advertising manager, Pam Marino, and all of our episodes are produced by Choice's digital media specialist, Mark Dirks. That's all for this week. Thanks for joining us.